Thank you so much, Aslak. Uh, so I'm Nicole Coleman. I've been in touch with many of you uh, in preparation for this conference, and I want to introduce our first keynote speaker of the morning, Brian Catanzaro. So Brian is um, Vice President of, uh, Appl of D Applied Deep Learning for NVIDIA. And the applied part is very critical because Brian is committed to very practical applications of deep learning. Um, none of this fanciful notions of uh, the hype about AI. Um, and as Aslak said, you know, we are not industry. Fortunately, here at Stanford, we're close to industry. And fortunately, here at Stanford Libraries, our um, associate uh, university librarian for uh, uh, public services and, um, and collection development, Matt Morasica, has a good friend, and his name is Brian Catanzaro. <laughs> so thanks to Matt, uh, we had Brian come uh, and visit and speak with us as part of our library conversations series, um, which started it was about a year and a half ago. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity for us to, to, to really get down uh, deep um, and understand what are the practical implications of this technology and what might the role for libraries be. Um, I think that was the beginning of a conversation that, that Brian has been, been continuing thinking about, and uh, he's going to tell us more about his thoughts on that. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Um, I'm really honored to be here today and, and talk a little bit about um, libraries and AI. Um, so I, I wanted to just explain a little bit more about where I'm coming from. Um, I work at NVIDIA. Some of you may know about NVIDIA and some of you may not. NVIDIA is a processor company. We, you know, Silicon Valley started with silicon. NVIDIA makes silicon. Um, and our processors are the best processors for AI, at least in my opinion. Um, and uh, so we have, we have found ourselves uh, collaborating with every company and every academic institution around the world trying to advance the state of AI. Um, and uh, as part of that work, uh, NVIDIA decided to start using AI for its own purposes, um, trying to figure out how AI could make NVIDIA a better company, because we see it impacting everywhere else. Um, and that's really what my job is, is I lead a research lab of about 40 scientists who are figuring out new ways of using um, artificial intelligence to make our company better. Um, now, when... Uh, when Catherine uh, invited me to come talk to you, when, when I had spoken with Stanford earlier about artificial intelligence and libraries, I, I feel like a lot of the discussion centered around what could I or people that I work with or the, the AI community in general, what, what could we do to help libraries be better? What kinds of new services could we provide? Um, and I think that's a really interesting and fruitful discussion, and I expect that AI is going to transform, continue to transform, it already has started to transform, but is going to continue to transform the way libraries do their work. Um, but today I wanted to kind of turn that around and come to you with a, a request for help um, and talk about instead what could libraries do for AI. I want to, I want to kind of explain to you um, some of the things that are going on in, in modern AI and uh, specifically the role of data sets in the current AI research, and you know, basically come with my hat in hand asking for help. Um, because I, I really do believe that um, the future progress of AI and the ways that we're going to be able to use AI to make the world a better place depend on having greater access to the information that you care for. Um, as Alsak, uh, As Aslak was, was mentioning earlier. Um, you know, you, you guys are custodians of the world's cultural heritage. The, the intelligence, the gathered intelligence of the world, um, you, you touch every day. And um, you know, the process of creating intelligence or using intelligence uh, requires access to that wisdom. Um, you know, a good book makes all the difference uh, for a human. And uh, so when I think about what librarians do, you know, uh, I'm not a librarian, but when I, when I think about what my ideal librarian does, it's, it's about curating, collecting data, and enabling learning and scholarship. Well, that's what we need to create the next generation of AI, is we need better data sets, we need better curation, we need better collections, um, and we need better access. Um, you know, a good data set makes all the difference for AI as well. Um, and in fact, 
um, I'm, as I'm going to show you today with a few examples from my lab and, and elsewhere, um, the data set is now becoming a fundamental part of the algorithm. It used to be that um, when we would think about algorithms, we would think about you know, the computational structures that underlie a particular uh, application. Nowadays, the data set is fundamentally becoming part of that algorithm. We can take the same computational structure and do remarkably different things. The only difference is what data was that model trained on. And so that means that the collection and curation of data sets, the skills that, that you, you guys practice, um, the, the resources that you have access to can enable the creation of new algorithms and new applications. And, and I really believe that um, going forward, uh, we're going to see uh, a, a lot of growth um, if we can access, uh, if, we, if we can figure out how to access the, the information that, that um, libraries have in a way that, that um, researchers like, my, uh, like those in my team can, can make use of. But we need help to do that. So um, I, I think it's probably well understood uh, by everyone that, that data sets are central to AI, but I, but I wanted to just kind of um, mention kind of the inflection point for, for the computer science community that, that really matters, uh, the, the ImageNet um, data set and the competition surrounding that. Um, it, it started, the competition first started in 2010, so the, it, it took a few years actually in, in the late uh, 2000s for Fei-Fei Li, who's a professor at Stanford uh, and now works also at Google, um, and her graduate students to collect um, a, a new data set of images from the natural world along with labels that describe what is contained in those images. And uh, those, those images were con collected not by somebody you know, who knew a lot about how to collect and cur curate a data set um, like you guys do, but rather through kind of brute force. So they went, they went to Flickr and other photography websites and downloaded as many pictures as they could. And then they sent those pictures to Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a way of you know, paying people on the internet to do small tasks. So we, so we pay people a few cents or I don't know, a dollar, I, f I forget exactly how much, but you know, not, not terribly much, um, to look at a picture and write down what, what is in that picture. Is it a picture of a container ship or is it a picture of a leopard? So this is a general data set, has lots of different stuff in it, and uh, the task was, you know, can you write a pr computer program that can identify what is in that image? And there's about a thousand different things. Um, and you can see um, on the right-hand side of the screen uh, what the progress looked like. Um, you know, when, when we first started um, in 2010, no team got more than, uh, got, uh, every team got at least 25% wrong. Um, so this is, this is kind of hard. If you think there's a thousand different objects, if you guess randomly, you're not going to guess right m much of the time. So, um, so it's a hard problem. Um, in 2012, there's this really big inflection point where um, Alex Krzyzewski uh, who, um, and Jeff Hinton and Ilya Sutskever, who are working at the University of Toronto, um, applied deep learning uh, to this, and it made a huge difference. Um, you can tell uh, there's a big gap between uh, the red dot at the bottom on the um, on the 2012 thing, which let's see if this works. Okay, here it is. This this gap right here is pretty huge, and then um, if you go from 2012 to 13, basically everybody jumped on board because this technique was was easy to use, um, and it got great results. And then you know you can see the rest is history. Um, human accuracy on this is somewhere around five percent. So um, the models in 2017, many of them are performing better than average humans on this. Uh, this image classification task. And then they shut down the competition because it was basically solved. Um, now, um, this kicked off huge progress in lots of different fields, in natural language processing, in speech recognition, um, in computer vision in general, because the techniques that, are, that were applied to this competition are very general. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's really exciting, and so people get you know, we talk a lot about deep learning um, and, and how important it is, and it's true, but, but I, but I want to draw the attention back to the data set, you know, that, that really the thing that made um, all of this happen, um, this deep learning revolution that's impacted so many different fields of computer science was a data set that was collected by graduate students in kind of a brute force way. 
And to be honest, that is still the state of the art in computer science. Um, most of the data sets that we collect to do artificial intelligence are collected um, in similar ways. So it's very highly automated. Um, it's usually based on scraping the internet, so like seeing what we can download from all the websites we can find. And then maybe using some mechanical Turk, which is you know very unskilled, very general purpose uh, human intelligence to add a little bit of labels that then we can use to train our models with. Um, so, so that's that's kind of an interesting question. You know, what could we do if we had if we had better data? Um, and actually, that's mostly what my team does. So, um, uh, I, I put this funny Dilbert comic about like, you know, can we use bad data? Well, sure, we can use bad data in any way, but you know, you can average bad data together, you can multiply it together. But really, the result of of any AI algorithm depends on having good data, and so the um, task of creating artificial intelligence these days really centers around understanding and refining data. And um, although I've described this kind of like bad way of creating data sets of like this brute force, you know, kind of unskilled, uncurated, like manual, like the, the kind of things that, that we computer scientists often do, um, we're doing it because this is the best that we know how. Um, but I think we could use some help from you. And that's, that's why I'm here today. You know, we do some other stuff, and, and AI researchers often, uh, you know, will talk about these other things, like working on the algorithms, the, the computational structures, the applications, how are we using AI, the systems, so we need to have huge computers to train and to deploy these huge AI models. But, um, you know, most of the time and the effort for new applications is about data. And uh, so, you know, when I think about uh, the work that goes on in my team, and I, I categorize this data work, um, you know, collecting data, making collections, um, curating data, making sure that it's high quality, um, diagnosing bugs in the data. Um, for example, if you're training a text model to understand the English language and you download all the web pages from the internet, a lot of those web pages have things that are not actually English text, like they might have emoji in them, or they might have like tables, you know, with that are made by, you know, ASCII art basically, like with, you know, plus signs and dashes and pipe characters and, you know, that stuff is not English. So if you feed that into an, a model that you're trying to teach about the structures of the English language, the model learns garbage and gets really confused. And so we have to spend a lot of time finding bugs in the data and throwing them out. And then, uh, you know, also uh, copyright and IP and uh, ethical questions about data are, are really important. Um, and so uh, basically the reason I'm here today and the reason I'm talking about all this to you today is you know, this question of like who does this for a living, I feel like you guys do. I feel like you guys know more about this than computer scientists do, and so we could use your help. You know, this, this, um, this uh, work of working on data sets that, we're, that the computer science community is doing at large scale right now um, is, is being done kind of in a brute force, unintelligent way. I think, I think we could use some help. <laughs> So um, a, a little bit more about um, machine learning. So uh, modern AI is all built around machine learning. And, and the way that this works is you have some sort of a model that is mathematical. It's basically just a function. You know, If you remember from math, a function is a, a mathematical structure that has a, an input and an output. And it maps from the input to the output. Um, and so what we'd like to do is find a function that maps from an input domain that we love to work with, like for example, um, text, and maps to another output domain that we would like to work with as well, like for example, the answers to questions contained in that text, or summaries of that text, or um, uh, you know, speech. You know, like trans we have the input as like a sound recording, which is a bunch of numbers that describe the amplitude of a pressure function in the air, and we want to, describe, we want to transcribe it, which is a function that turns that, those amplitudes into characters of text that describe what the person said. Now, we know these mappings exist. We can implement them as humans, um, but we would like a computer to do that. And so um, machine learning, we have this, we have this model, which is a, basically a mathematical description of a space of, uh, of functions, and then we have data. Um, and then we train the model, which is a process of fitting. So it's basically a regression. We're, we're trying to adjust the parameters in our model, and we may have billions of those parameters. So these are very highly uh, 
parameterized models with lots of degrees of freedom. We would like to fit those to the data as best we can, and that, that creates our algorithm. Now, um, a lot of AI researchers will work with standard data sets like ImageNet or MNIST. MNIST is really well used. It's, um, it comes from the US Postal Service. It's a, it's a bunch of pictures of handwritten digits for zip codes. And um, it's a very small data set by today's standards, but it's useful because you know, it's really easy to understand and you can do lots of fun things with it. Um, now, the, the sort of realities of computer science research are that um, you know, people tend to want to focus on mostly on the models and they don't want to focus on the data because computer science is about modeling and, and mathematics and less about the actual data itself. That would be more of what you guys do is understand the data. And so because of that, a lot of people in computer science have this idea that the data is somebody else's job. Somebody else is going to create a data set and then we're, we're just going to use it. Um, in, in my lab, because we're an applied lab, our job is to use AI to make NVIDIA a better place. We don't accept that. So anytime somebody in my lab says, um, I have this great idea for a new model, it will be amazing, but I can't really test it because I don't have the right data, then I say, well, then I don't think you have a very good idea. Basically, any idea that, that you would like to advance for improving the models needs to be supported by data. You have to work on the data as, as the first part of the problem. Because data availability really constrains our research and our applications. Okay, so I've been claiming over and over again uh, that the data set is, is fundamentally part of the algorithm. I wanna show you a few examples. Um, I'm gonna start with a visual one because you know, NVIDIA also makes graphics um, hardware. We, you know, we render video games, so we like, we like graphics. Um, so here's a model that uh, my team created a few years back. Um, and what it does is take a semantic um, map, which is basically like kind of a, uh, a simple representation of where things are in an image and fills in all the details. So if I, let's see if I can go back. Um, let's see if I do this. So the input is this kind of cartoon and then the output of the model is a street scene. So it's got the trees and it's got like details about how the cars are rendered and um, shadows and so forth. All of that's coming from the model. So we're training, we're training this model with the input being a semantic map, um, which we extract from natural images using some, some other model. And then uh, the output is the, the actual scene. And this is really cool because it, it's like a new way of thinking about graphics. It's a generative model for rendering graphics. This has lots of applications for um, you know, how we're gonna create virtual worlds in the future. Um, if we can do that from real data, that would be amazing. Now, um, so this is, this is one uh, thing you can do with this model, is you can render street scenes. Now, we released our model on GitHub uh, and uh, the training code so that anybody could train a different model, and uh, there's this really great artist named Mario Klingemann uh, who works at Google, um, who took that same model and did something else with it, um, he hooked it up to a webcam and then is able to transform, you know, an image of his face from the webcam into something that looks like a, you know, a painting from a museum. Um, now, before this sort of deep learning revolution, it would have been hard to see how these two things are the same, right? Like a thing that renders street scenes and a thing that renders old paintings, how are these the same? Um, it turns out they're actually identically the same, it's just that they're trained on different data sets. Um, and so the choice of data then has a huge implication on the actual algorithm that, that you're making. Um, now, one of the things that, that I also wanted to point out is that Mario um, also put this little asterisk here, applicants must be white and over 40 years old. Um, why is that? It's because of the data set that he trained on, right? So he, the, the data set that he trained on was a bunch of pictures that he downloaded from a website from a museum, uh, and they were mostly pictures of you know middle-aged white men, and you know so that's that's kind of the the the, the ethical concerns that come along um, with the data sets that we use. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but um, anyway, there's there's an example of you know one model doing very different things 
I would, I would say these are different algorithms. They do such different things. Um, but it's actually the same computational structure. It's just being trained on a different data set. And we'll, we'll talk about some more examples. Um, one of the most important um, things going on right now is um, conversational AI. So um, this is creating assistance that humans can interact with, that can help us solve problems, uh, can help us answer questions, um, usually speech-driven. So you talk uh, using natural language, actually you know, vocalizing a question, it goes into a computer, the computer understands it, generates a response, synthesizes a result, um, also in speech, and you can hear, hear the answer. Um, now, this is a huge endeavor. Um, lots of companies are working on it. There's been a huge amount of progress in the past year. Um, and it's mostly been driven by unsupervised large-scale language modeling, which basically means we are hungry for text. We want as much text as possible, and we train our models to understand the structure of language. Um, and uh, with that, once we have that structure, we can use that to solve lots of different kinds of problems. So the Glue benchmark actually has nine different tasks in it, which are mostly things that you might see in a, um, a school English reading comprehension exam, like, for example, um, you know, pronoun disambiguation, like, you know, what, what is the actual subject that, the, that a particular pronoun is referring to? Or um, are these two sentences semantically equivalent? There's nine different tasks. And um, you can see that, that last year um, when BERT was released, there was this huge jump. And that was from Google. Since then, Microsoft and Facebook um, and, and Google, again, have been battling over who has the, the best language understanding models. And they're all built on these huge unsupervised um, uh, language models. How do we train them? Well, um, almost all of the work is done with something very simple. So um, we take text, and we remove some of the words. And then we ask the model to fill it back in. It's kind of like Mad Libs, if you've ever played that. Um, and uh, BERT actually had another task as well. There's some debate in the community as to whether this is important, but it, they actually took two sentences that may have come from the same document or, or may have come from different documents and then asked the model to predict, um, does the second sentence logically follow the first? Um, so in this particular example, we have the two sentences here. Uh, initially, he supported himself and his, and so we kind of understand that probably family is the highest probability word that should go in there, right? And so, that, so we can fill in all the blanks. And then, then the second sentence, um, um, this in turn attracted the attention of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch with Senator Reporter to Murray to uh, personally review Stubblefield's wireless telephone. The question is, does that sentence relate to the first sentence initially he supported himself and his family by farming on, the, on, uh, on a plot of family land? Probably not. Right? So what we're asking the model to do is learn those two things. Can I fill in the blanks, and can I check whether two sentences logically follow each other? And we can, we can create this from any text. Right? Like we, we just need a big database of text. We can create the true answers to these questions, and then we can train a model. And so this is the basis um, behind all of the progress that's happening in conversational AI right now um, is, is these huge language models. Um, and I'm actually going to skip this slide in the, in the interest of time. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the things that's happening is um, that as we make these language models larger and larger, um, give them more space to learn about the world and about the data and about um, you know, the structure of the problems that we're trying to solve, they, they learn increasingly useful things. Um, and so my lab, you know, we, we've been working on scaling these models um, quite a bit bigger, and we, we have a model that's, you know, about 24 times the size of, of the BERT models that have attracted so much attention. And so now we're asking the question, what, what can we do with that? And uh, here's one thing that we can do with it. We can do text generation. Um, so we trained a model on a bunch of news articles up to the summer of 2019. Um, and then we asked it to... Uh, complete a prompt, um, uh, well, we asked it to complete many prompts. I've chosen one for you because I thought it was fun, um, about uh, Greta Thunberg. So the, the, we gave it a quote from Greta Thunberg, you have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words, and yet I'm one of the lucky ones. You guys probably remember this quote. It was kind of famous, right? Um, and so 
Then we ask the model to, to um, complete the text, and I'll read what it says. In Australia, a similar push has been led by 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg, who has led protests in the Swedish capital of Stockholm. On Saturday, Thunberg joined forces with the well-known climate activist and former US Vice President Al Gore to lead a Live Earth concert in the Norwegian capital of Oslo. The concert and protest was aimed at drawing attention to the need to reduce carbon emissions. Thunberg told the crowd that even though she was tired, I'm happy that I'm here, I'm happy that I'm not just doing it for myself, but that I'm doing it for all of you. Um, I'll stop reading now because you kind of get the point. Um, so for me as an AI researcher, this is really amazing because uh, you know, we trained the model um, on news articles before Greta Thunberg was actually that famous. Um, but she was showing up in the early uh, part of 2019 in the news enough for the model to learn things about her, right? So when we gave it the prompt, we didn't actually tell anything, uh, we didn't say anything about who it was about other than the word Thunberg. And the model knew that probably if we were talking about Thunberg, we were talking about Greta Thunberg. The model knew that she's 16 year old, years old. Uh, it knew that she's from Sweden. It knew that Stockholm is the capital of Sweden. It knew that it was likely that um, you know, she might do something with Al Gore. Uh, it knew that Oslo is the capital of Norway. It knew that there could be some sort of a concert and a protest about climate change. All these things are possible, right? Um, and the thing is that we didn't teach the model any of that. We just trained it on a bunch of news articles. Um, and, and because the model has so many parameters, it's able to learn things about the structure of English language that go beyond just the grammar, but also reach into the semantic meaning of what, what is actually plausible, you know, what kinds of things are actually plausible. And so that, that really gives us new ways of, of creating um, text, which, which really um, is gonna help us solve problems with uh, conversational AI. Um, we took the same model and we fine-tuned it on text from Wikipedia, and it made this Wikipedia article on uh, and, and then we gave it the prompt, Zaire, United States Relations. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but uh, what I want, wanted to get uh, across is that it kind of looks like a Wikipedia article. It has a bunch of made up facts in it. These facts are you know, fairly logically consistent, not, not perfectly, but fairly logically consistent. It makes up a bunch of names, which are plausible given the context of the article. Um, and again, this is, this is just taking a, a model that was trained on a huge amount of text and fine tuning it on Wikipedia. Um, now we can also fine tune the model on some books um, and have the model generate something that looks more like a novel. Uh, this, again, uh, same model, just fine tuned on a, on a different data set. Um, and you know, this looks fair, fairly like a novel. It's talking about art, it's talking about family, it's talking about relationships with parents. It's, it has characters and you know, it's, it's logically consistent. Okay, so now I, I hope that I threw up some red flags when I was talking to you about this because what do you think, you know, librarians, holders of the world's knowledge, that the best that we know how to do as AI researchers is to train our models on Wikipedia? How does that make you feel? Like, is Wikipedia the right source of information for the AI of the future? Of course, Wikipedia is amazing and we love Wikipedia, but you know, is, is Wikipedia really the best thing to train models on? Now, the books corpus, I think, is even worse than Wikipedia. Uh, it is collected by computer scientists, uh, con consists of 11,038 free books written by unpublished authors. Uh, and what was the criterion uh, that was used to include them? Well, they ne the stories needed to be at least 20,000 words each because uh, you know, short stories by unpublished authors are not very high quality. Um, so uh, are these the right data sets to build artificial intelligence, right? Why is it that you know, the best that us computer scientists know how to do is train stuff on unpublished books? Well, it's because that's what we have access to in a way that we understand how to use. Now, there, there are, I'm sure that there are better um, data sets out there. Um, I'm sure you guys have access to better data sets, but there's a missing link here. There's, not, there, there's some sort of missing connection between the knowledge that the world has and the people that are creating AI. And that's kind of why I'm here today with my hat in hand. You know, what are the right data sets to build AI? I actually don't know, because I'm, I'm more, you know, I've spent most of my life working with technology and, and not with um, the world's collected information, but you guys have. Um, and so, you know, so we should, we should, we should be asking this question. You know, what, what, could we, what could we build together if we were able to train on more specialized corpora instead of on things like Wikipedia, all of Wikipedia, or things like, um, you know, uh, 
novels of, of varying quality that we found for free on the internet. You know, I believe that a long tail of data sets could create a long tail of applications. Like, what if we were to train one of these models on scientific articles from very particular fields, like botany or chemistry or physics? Or, you know, and each of these, of course, has subspecialties, as you guys know, right? Um, there's a lot of literature in the subspecialties of math, for example, or, or of medicine, right? Like, what if we train one of these just on a particular kind of, you know, oncology? Or, um, you know, like, what, what kinds of applications could we make? Um, what if we trained them on specific types of literature, like, you know, just trained on short stories from Chekhov or, or novels uh, from Dickens? Or, you know, um, what if we were able to train on very particular kinds of practical guides, like user manuals, um, cookbooks? Um, what if we were able to train on specific types of paintings? Um, what could we build? Well, you know, as computer scientists, obviously the, the first thing that we do along this line is think about code. Um, and uh, this is a, a tool based on the same model that I was just showing you about Greta Thunberg and Wikipedia and books, only what if we trained it on computer code? So we went to the internet. Computer code is available on the internet. What if we treat computer code like English language and train a model to understand computer code? Um, we can make a tool like this. Um, what, what's happening here is that the programmer is typing, and then it's getting suggestions, and these suggestions um, are very high-level suggestions that are not just uh, syntactic about like you know what things would be legal to write in this computer program, but they're actually semantic. Um, basically, the computer has seen programs that are doing similar things to this before, and it's helping the programmer write the meaning of the program rather than just the form of it. This is really exciting because you know programmers would love to increase their productivity. It takes a lot of work to write code. You know, what if we had a tool that could help us do that better, right? And so. Uh, there are companies and institutions. This comes from a company called Tab9, um, but uh, but there there are people working on this. You know, like if we train these models on computer code, maybe we can increase the productivity of, of people writing computer code. You know, and and speaking back to um, Asak's uh, 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 Asak's uh, uh, discussion about the human condition. You know, like what kinds of tools could we make to improve the human condition? Um, you know, I think this is one of them, right? Like, if we can make programmers more effective, I think that'll have benefits for all of humanity because technology is underlying so much of what we do today. But I think that you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't only use technology to make technology better. We should try to do things in art, for example, better. Um, I went to uh, just a, a museum website on the internet, uh, the Royal Asiatic Collections. They have um, a nice collection of, for example, Asian art on the internet. Um, and so it's interesting to think about what could we do if we trained a model just on a bunch of uh, art from a particular domain. Um, and uh, here's a, a video of uh, uh, a project that we did at NVIDIA to make tools for people to, to create art using um, landscapes. So we, we just downloaded a bunch of uh, images of landscapes from the internet, um, and we were able to make this tool. Let's see if, uh, if we can watch this. Um, it's OK if the sound doesn't work. I'll just narrate. Basically, um, uh, this is, again, going off of this idea of like what can we do to transform um, a semantic map into an image. So we have a palette of different kinds of objects, like sky, water, river, rock, mountain. And then what we're doing is, uh, in real time, we can edit this uh, that semantic map to create and then smart paintbrush. Oh, here we go. So that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want, and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is going to be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. The input to this model is something we call a segmentation map. It's like a coloring book picture that describes, here's where a tree is, here's where the sky is, here's where the ground is. And it doesn't have any details. 
and then the neural network is able to fill in all the texture and shadows and the colors based on things that it's learned from a large database of real-world images. I would like to see that tree reflecting in that pond. The real advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to in the past. I really think this technology is going to be great for the dreamers of the world. All right, so, um, so that was a fun project, right? Um, but what if we could make it more useful by training it on you know, more specific data sets, right? And I feel like you guys have access to that. So um, I'm coming to the end here. Um, you know, I really feel like AI needs better data. We're training on data sets that computer scientists collected because they were easily at hand. Um, they're not the right data sets to solve the problems that humanity faces. Uh, we expect AI is gonna have a bigger impact on the world, but how are we gonna do that if we don't have access to the intelligence that the world has created? Um, that's, that's really why I'm coming here with my hat in hand asking for help, is that you know, we, we need better practices for collecting data. We need data collected by specialists so that we can train models um, to, to learn the things that specialists know that encompass you know, the, the wide variety of human creativity and uh, the problems that humans face. And that's what libraries do, so that's, that's why I'm here. Now, um, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention copyright and ethics. So, um, you know, we're learning, I think, as a community about the implications of this technology in terms of copyright and ethics. Um, there's been some scandals recently about, um, about this. For example, um, face recognition software, it turned out, was racist and sexist because the data sets it was used were biased. And then um, IBM did this great thing. They tried to do a great thing of going to the internet downloading images that were marked as Creative Commons, which if you recall, the Creative Commons license gives people the right to do anything with the data, right? For commercial purposes, non-commercial purposes, it's just Creative Commons, it's, it's out there, you can do whatever you'd like. Um, IBM collected Creative Commons license data and trained a model to, the purpose of this model was to reduce bias in face recognition. So they were actually actively trying to reduce racism and sexism in their face recognition model. But in so doing, uh, they triggered another controversy because um, people didn't feel like they had given consent for IBM to use their face in any sort of face recognition model. Now, of course, they, these people had uploaded their pictures to Flickr under a Creative Commons license, but they didn't really know, they didn't really understand what that meant. They didn't really understand the, whether they were giving consent for their face to be used in this manner. And um, if you read the popular press, like the New York Times came out with an article that really castigated IBM for doing this, you would think that you know, IBM was making the world a worse place when really what they were trying to do was a good thing, I think, which is to make face recognition not racist and not sexist. I think we should all want that. Um, but you know, how do you go about collecting a data set to do that? There's a bunch of ethical and, and copyright um, questions. You know, and Creative Commons, for example, gave IBM copyright permissions to do this, but, you know, judging by the controversy, it's not clear whether it gave them, you know, the, the consent to actually do this. Um, and, and so there's, there's questions, there's a lot of new questions about how data is being used to create these algorithms. Um, and um, AI researchers need to learn how to use data ethically and properly. And we need people that understand these issues to help us. And again, like I come to you, I feel like librarians know these things, right? Like this is what a lot of you think about is like what, what is, you know, how do, how do we use data in the right way? You know, you, 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 know, you understand these things well. Um, and so we need, we need not just data, not just the raw mass of data, but we actually need data that, that we can use um, in order to train these models and, and, you know, people agree that that's a good thing to do. So, okay, uh, in conclusion, you know, AI needs more intelligence, and where are we gonna get that but from the wisdom of the ages, uh, from the libraries that hold that wisdom? Um, I believe libraries have a great deal to offer to the creation of future AI algorithms, and uh, I think there's huge in opportunities to improve the human condition by doing so. Thank you. Right, thank you for a great talk. Um, I had a question, there's a wonderful documentary about Google Books where a, mon a monk in, an, uh, in a 13th century uh, monastery in Spain is very sad that he gave all his books away to uh, Google Books uh, 10 years ago. So um, 
I don't want to come across as uh, adversarial, so maybe pun intended, but uh, why should we give, why should library actually give away their data for free maybe, or should uh, companies like Nvidia or Google not pay for them? Uh, should we, uh, is this a, really a collaboration or is this more a transaction? Uh, would be my question. Oh, well, that's, I think that's an interesting question. You know, um, I'm, I'm not really a business person, so I'm more of a researcher. So like my goal is to, further um, you know, what, what possibilities are for humanity, and I believe that we need to work together. The actual particulars of like, you know, who gets paid for what service, I think that's, that's really good questions, but I'm not as well equipped to answer them. I, I would say, though, that um, you know, um, Aslak said um, in his introduction that libraries have always had the spirit of openness, that libraries have been a place not just to hoard information, but to help humanity with that information. And I personally believe that the most important, um, uh, well, maybe not the most important thing the whole world knows about, but for me at least, the most important work that I can do is by building AI that uses um, the humanities uh, information to, to solve problems that humanity faces. Um, and so I hope that, that we can come to agreements about that. Um, I, I, I'm, I haven't watched this documentary that, that you referred to. Maybe I should go look it up. Um, but I'm, I'm curious why a monk uh, would be sad about giving away um, very specialized manuscripts. I mean, I, if I was that monk and I had been treasuring those manuscripts and now there is a possibility of people throughout the world valuing them in the way that I did, do and using them to solve problems that I care about, um, that, that seems like a good thing. So, um, so I hope that, that we can find ways that, that benefit everyone. Thanks. Um, very impressive work you do. Um, here at the li at Stanford Libraries purchases high quality data sets, and I'm wondering if your lab has ever, if you have considered doing that. Um, my lab purchases data sets all the time. However, uh, we don't, we haven't typically purchased library quality data sets, and I feel like we should start doing that. I mean, so like for example, you know, when we're training on free books from the internet from unpublished authors, you know, I think that is reducing the quality of our work. I think if we trained on, you know, data sets of, of actually high quality work that had been edited and curated and so forth, um, we, we would have better results. And so I think uh, in the future, we will see computer scientists um, purchasing access to um, data sets in in larger quantities, but but I would say you know this is this is um, already you know it's already pretty well understood that um, access access to data is a competitive advantage, and so companies do invest in data. Um, a great great talk, but I, I was wondering whether uh, your presentation can be kind of turned around on its head, and that yes, the librarians have the data, but. Uh, enterprises like NVIDIA could provide tools to librarians so that librarians can more easily train these systems and without having to be technical at all? Or does it really require deep knowledge of the models that librarians might not have to, to do this and to tweak these things? Um, absolutely, it will be possible for um, more and more people to create these kinds of models to train them themselves. And certainly it's something that NVIDIA cares a lot about. Um, you know, if you just think about how our business operates, you know, we, we um, are in the business of providing infrastructure to institutions to do this, right? So we would love for more people to do this rather than less. Um, I think that um, there has been a trend towards more accessibility and, and, and sort of, you know, you, you, the, the sort of priesthood of machine learning researchers is becoming less and less necessary for a lot of uh, these applications, specifically in text modeling. I think, uh, you know, the, the big, huge language models trained on large text databases are so powerful that, um, you know, they can be trained uh, without a lot of specialized knowledge. So, so I hope that we'll see more of that um, in the future. Um, uh, and, and I would love to do that. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's definitely something that, that's definitely one way that this technology could progress, right, is that librarians um, start training AI models on their own. Thank you. Thank you.